how it can be told. History in the making as the mysterious Shangri-La. Actually, the United States Navy aircraft carrier Hornet steams westward across the Pacific. A protecting force of cruisers and destroyers, with the hard-hitting Admiral Halsey in command, slams into a gale, determined to reach a position 400 miles from Tokyo, unless intercepted by the enemy. Packed on the afterdeck of the Hornet are 16 B-25 Mitchell bombers. Never before have these huge planes been launched from a carrier. High explosive and demolition bombs are made ready for the destruction of military objectives in Japan. Colonel, now Major General Doolittle, with Captain Mark Mitcher, commander of the aircraft carrier Hornet, who was once decorated by Japan, now gives his medal to be returned to the Japs on the tail of a bomb. Not until they are miles at sea do these men know definitely the mission for which they have volunteered. Their mission? Bomb Tokyo, just four months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. It had three real purposes. One purpose was to give the folks at home the first good news that we had had in World War II. It caused the Japanese to question their warlords. And from a tactical point of view, it caused the retention of aircraft in Japan for the defense of the home islands when we had no intentions of hitting them again seriously in the near future. Those airplanes would have been much more effective in the South Pacific where the war was going on. Suddenly a strange vessel is sighted. It's a Jap patrol boat, and the task force intends to destroy it before a warning can be radioed to Japan. this point in the story a person may wonder why it was such a big deal that the Japanese um, boat saw the ships coming well in World War two there were not there wasn't radar and satellite imagery like we have today uh, a ship this size that would never go across the seas un unnoticed today uh, but back then what they had to rely on were their patrol boats moving around and, and seeing the seas and seeing the enemy coming um, unfortunately, as a result of the Japanese boat seeing uh, General Doolittle coming, he had to uh, make a quick decision. And the decision was, do we have enough fuel to fly all the way to Tokyo, drop the bombs, and make it all the way in? Um, and, and here's a picture of, the, of what one of the planes on the USS Hornet looked like and, and some of the airmen there. But he um, ultimately made the decision, and they had to go. And there really wasn't any other choice at that at that time. If they wanted any chance of this mission succeeding, they could not get attacked. Um, they had to completely rely on on nobody knowing that they were coming. Jimmy Doolittle asked Admiral Halsey to go in closer for another hour and a half. And now the signal is flashed for the takeoff. Ten hours ahead of schedule. The added distance to be flown increases the hazard. There is no hesitation. They man their planes. Doolittle pilots the lead plane. There's a breathless moment as the big bomber gathers speed. It's airborne. The first army bomber ever to be launched from a carrier is safely in the air. We came in on the deck. We pulled up to about 1,500 feet to bomb in order to make sure that we weren't hit by the fragments of our own bomb. And I would say that the 
feeling was get the job done and get the heck out of there. The actual damage done by the raid was minimal. We were 16 airplanes, each carrying one ton of bomb. In later raids, General LeMay with his 20th Air Force sent out 500 planes on a mission, each carrying 10 tons of bombs. The planes sweep in without being discovered. They separate into groups to attack the several objectives carefully selected by means of accurate intelligence to ensure that only targets of military value will be hit. Colonel Doolittle himself has told of flying over the Emperor's palace and refraining from bombing it, though he could have left it in ruins. Reaching a safe haven after the raid wasn't easy. And because they had to take off much sooner than planned, they were very low on fuel. One crew went to Vladivostok. The other 15 of us proceeded until we got to the coast of China. When we got to China, two airplanes were so low on fuel that they landed in the surf alongside of, of the beach. Uh, two people were drowned. Eight of them got ashore. The weather was quite bad, and uh, so we flew on till we got to where we thought we were as close as we could get to where we wanted to go, having been on dead reckoning for quite a while that we weren't precisely there, and then we all jumped. Now, this point in the story is the, the point that probably took um, as much faith as any point in the story for uh, Doolittle's men um, when they when they were over China, none of them could speak Chinese. And they were jumping out of an airplane into a foreign land where they'd never been and just having faith that the Chinese people who they met were going to be friendly to their cause. And like he said, um, you know, here's a picture of the of the wreckage of, of General Doolittle's airplane. You know, they just jumped out of their airplanes. They were flying at low altitude. They were running out of fuel. And they really had no choice. They just jumped out of their planes, abandoned them, and allowed the planes to crash into the ground, saving their own lives. And thankfully, uh, the people that they met in China were friendly and helped them out. Eighty crew members flew in the Doolittle raid. Sixty-four returned to fight again. They were part of a team recognized for its professionalism and heroism a rich heritage remembered by a new generation of airmen. It happened April 18th, 1942. Los Angeles turns out in force to scream a welcome to two of the war's outstanding heroes, General Blood and Guts Patton and General Jimmy Doolittle. Along the route, nearly two million people turn out to acclaim the man who beat the Germans at their own game of mechanized warfare. <laughs> ...are given prominent display for Doolittle, as well as G.I. Joe, needs your help. General Doolittle, Tokyo bound again, has the right slant when he says, I'd like to form a team now, the home team and the field team, and to say that if you will furnish us the supplies, if you will furnish the ships, if you will deliver the supplies, we, the field team, will see that they're properly used and bring this war to a prompt conclusion. Thank you. And General Doolittle's words proved true as the American public funded the war and made sure to send plenty of ammunition and supplies overseas um, for the soldiers. Um, saw a prompt end to the war, uh, that speech given in April of 1945. Uh, the war was ended very soon after that. And um, General Doolittle and his raid uh, proved to be one of the major turning points in the war and one of the reasons why the war did end so quickly. And we are um, very grateful, and he and his, his crew um, remain true American heroes even to this day. <laughs>